My name is Martha Herbert. I'm a pediatric neurologist and researcher. I work at the Massachusetts General Hospital, which is affiliated with Harvard Medical School, and I'm also affiliated with the Cambridge Center for Child and Adolescent, Cambridge Health Alliance Center for Child and Adolescent Development. And I do brain imaging research, including MRI, EEG, and MEG to learn about the uh, structural and dynamic properties of autistic brains. I became interested in autism um, kind of by accident um, about 12 years ago when uh, I started working in a brain imaging lab in the hopes of studying the neurobiology of emotion. And um, I was given a large data set of MRI scans of children with autism and related disorders. And as I started analyzing them and thinking about them, and thinking about the kids whom I was seeing in my clinic a little bit more than I had seen in residency, um, it just got more and more interesting and different than what I had been led to expect. So, uh, so you don't come into this as a parent uh, with an affected child? No, I don't. I don't have an affected child. Okay. Um, can you tell me about uh, the current state of your work right now, what you're doing? Well, in the when I analyzed all of these brains, which were imaged quite a long time ago, starting in 1989 and through the early 90s, um, I was looking for parts of the brain that might correlate with behavioral deficits. And I didn't find that. But I did find that high-functioning autistic brains were larger than uh, controls. And the low-functioning autistic brains were larger than their non-autistic IQ match controls. That is big brains. And then I found that it was white matter that was making them big, the, the part of the brain which has the wires that connect the nerve cells. And it's white because of this fatty substance, myelin. Um, and then I found it was the, late, the later developing white matter, the later myelinating white matter that was the largest. So I got very interested to find out whether the uh, altered volume of white matter has anything to do with the connectivity properties of the brain. Because Marcel Just and his colleagues in Pittsburgh have found out that there is reduced connectivity between different parts of the brain. And this was previously found by Barry Horowitz and Starkstein. And, um, but we don't know if that has anything to, the, to do with the white matter or not. So now I'm starting to study the timing properties of the brain. Uh, Marcel Just's e, uh, under connectivity work was with fMRI, and that can measure changes as close, as short as one second. But we're going to use MEG, magnetoencephalography is what MEG means, and EEG, electroencephalography, to look at changes as short as one millisecond. So it'll be uh, a thousand times more temporal resolution. And then what we'll be able to do is see very, very early changes in brain processing and brain signaling in, in autism. And my sense is that we may find some really interesting things there. Would, would this be uh, most useful as a diagnostic tool? Well, there, there, there are several things. Uh, first, first of all, we may find that there are profiles of signaling abnormalities that are diagnostic or maybe diagnostic in combination with a little bit of other information. Secondly, we may find things which challenge some of the assumptions that we've been making about autism. For example, if we find that the things that are abnormal in these brains happen in multiple different parts of the brain and multiple different functions of the brain, that will point to some underlying abnormality that's common and widely distributed, which could be inflammation that could be changing the conductive properties of the brain. Um, and finally, if we find measures that are sensitive to the timing and connectivity properties, and we treat children, we could repeat those measures and see if they improve after treatment. So they could be good to track the effectiveness of various treatment modalities. In terms of causality, have, uh, have you a picture of what's leading to these uh, changes in brain development? My own feeling is that, um, well, first of all, it looks like the brains get large rapidly in the first couple of years after birth. 
So that's a timing thing which says that whatever is going on, it isn't all over before you're born. Secondly, there appear to be more children being diagnosed than there were a long time ago, uh, or even not such a long time ago. Since the 80s and into the 90s, the numbers have gone substantially up. And um, that suggests that we need to look at environmental factors. There's no way, no one has proved that this is all an illusion. Um, and therefore, I would say that there's some kind of set of brain mechanisms that are responding to environmental triggers that are greater than they were in the past. And that's, that's my sense of things. And I'm not a wet lab person. I don't go and cut up tissue and stain for different things. That's just not my skill set. So what I'm trying to do is see whether we can find traces of these changes uh, in the way the brain functions and the way it's structured. And I do plan to collaborate more and more with people who do tissue studies and also animal models to see if we can make sense of this whole thing. Uh, what, Burbacher, for instance, or someone like that? or Yeah, well, there are people in my area who we're talking with to come up with various animal models to study the structure and function of brain tissue okay. in models which are similar to what we're hypothesizing could be going on in, in autism. Now, when you talk about environmental uh, toxins or triggers, what um, specifically are you seeing more of a certain kind than? Uh, no, I'm not seeing it because I, I don't have a regular program of reliable measures. In the data that I analyzed before, nobody was thinking this way and there were no blood tests performed at all. So I can't judge from that. I can't even judge from that data set whether the kids regressed or not because there was no concept at that time of regressive autism, so there are no questions in the questionnaires that were given to the families that would help you make up your mind whether there was regression or not. In my prospective studies, I'm planning to measure, um, well, I'm required to measure genetics, and I'm also, when I draw blood, going to study immune and exposure and biochemical um, measures as well. So in the studies in that, that I'm carrying on henceforth, I will be able to collect that data, but up until now, I haven't had that data. And I'm also working on um, developing some consensus meetings around the kind of biomarkers that researchers more generally could use, even if they don't know very much about immunology or chemistry. Many people, if you handed them a kit and said, look, draw this tube of blood and send it to us and we'll run it, they might be willing to participate in collecting data about the immune system, toxicology, biochemistry. But they, left to their own devices, they wouldn't be, know where to start to figure this out on their own. So I think that a lot of the prospective and ongoing studies that researchers are doing would help us more if we could have those kinds of data collected as well as whatever behavioral or brain or genetic data that people were connect, collecting in the first place. Now you, you mentioned uh, these, these uh, measurement tools, the EEGs, the uh, MEGs, and yeah. so on. Um, and, and you mentioned uh, you know, measuring before and after treatment to, to check for changes. Yeah. What treatments do you think might, might possibly bring about changes for you, for you to measure? Well, there, we're, I mean, I'm working with a group of people, and we have various ideas. Um, the pharmacological, uh, nutritional diet um, are the main ones that we're thinking about starting with. There are, uh, one of my colleagues did a drug study a few years ago, and I, I imagine we'll follow that up with biological measures because uh, one of her colleagues did do EEG before and after and, and noted substantial changes. My, I'm very interested in seeing whether we can elicit those kinds of brain function changes from uh, nutritional interventions. I'd love to try a, a combo trial or even to do an omega-3 fatty acid trial and track it with EEG. It um, be very interesting to try a diet trial in an appropriately selected group of people and see. Um, but we haven't started those trials yet. So there's a variety. I mean, what I really think we need to do and I haven't, uh, I don't have funding yet to do this. I'm hoping that we'll develop a network of private funders to support a clinical treatment network. Um, we need to develop a database so active clinicians can participate in this and also research centers to really collect more consistent data across sites 
that we can analyze to see if uh, there are either good treatments or good combinations of treatments. Um, and then, then get biological measures to track the efficacy. Now, uh, would you also uh, run the, 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 those same kinds of uh, trials for things like uh, heavy metals, the effects of heavy metals on the brain, or, or, or the effects of removing heavy metals from the body would have on the brain? I wouldn't mind doing that. Uh, but in order to do that, you would need to have a well-constructed trial of all the different aspects of it. You would have to have the way that you were handling heavy metal re reduction or body burden reduction done in a systematic and responsible way. And I don't have the resources to do that right now. Okay. At some point, it would be, I mean, I really think that the biomedical interventions, be they diet, nutrition, or pharmacological, need to be linked to objective evidence that there are changes in the brain and not just behavioral reports. It would just make the whole thing hang together better and it would give it more credibility. So that's, with my skill set, I think I could contribute to that happening. Mm -hmm. uh, now, d does it work, like the Vargas study with the, the, the inflammation, did, did, does that interest uh, what, what you're involved in? A lot. Yeah, I'm very interested in neuroinflammation. Uh, I think that it's a decisive uh, concept in making a demand on the autism research community to think much more about the underlying tissue substrate of the behaviors that have up until now been a major focus. If you have a brain that has tissue that's physically ill, then that ought to change the conduction properties of that tissue, and that could be what's causing the behaviors. I should note that the behavior people don't tend to look at the tissue, and the tissue people don't tend to look at the behavior. And my hope is to contribute to bridging those two domains so we can see, both in human and animal models, what the linkages are and what kinds of interventions. And you could do this in animal models, really improve the, 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 um, the, the conduction signaling properties of the tissue in ways that might be helpful for kids. And there, there are interventions that people are already doing. It would be very interesting to see how much they affected not only the inflammation, but also the electrical properties. That hasn't been done at all. Yeah, it sounds like, uh, sounds like a no-brainer. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but it's amazing. People just are in their little corners of research. And even, you know, it's, it's not so easy. I mean, I thought of this a while ago, but to actually get the resources together to pull it off means finding people with multiple levels of expertise who are willing to work together on this theme. I think I've done it, but it wasn't an overnight thing. Absolutely. Well, my own sense of the overall problem is that there may be a few specific environmental culprits that are contributing a disproportionate amount to this problem. But I'm personally of the view that it is confounded by a lot of other ambient toxins. There are so many nasty substances in our environment. We have about 58,000 chemicals on the market that have never been tested for safety. And they're worse in combination. And each of us is walking around with hundreds, if not thousands, of them in our bodies. And what that means from a practical point of view, number one, is that the traditional demands that scientists place on themselves for precision are going to be confounded by all of these substances which are too low in their levels to really poison us, but which are by, by no means too low. I mean, that is to say, instead of a double negative, they could plausibly affect brain uh, functioning, and they could plausibly lead to things like oxidative stress and inflammation, which could uh, interfere with optimal brain functioning. So I think that what we need to look for is final common pathways by which multiple different kinds of environmental stressors impact the brain and uh, treatments that will support us in our response mechanisms to environmental stressors. I don't think we're going to have the luxury of coming up with exact, precise answers because the whole substrate is too messed up. And we just have to take responsibility for the unfortunate mess that we're in and that our planet is in and, and do the kind of science that will help us get a grip 
on surviving through this and also help us stop messing things up on an ongoing basis and start uh, living in a more sustainable way. So the final common pathways are a, a great way to, uh, to forensically trace back to what happened. Uh, they but, might but not trace back specifically because, for example, you can get, I mean, you can get inflammation from mercury, cadmium, arsenic, diesel fuel pollution, um, various pol persistent organic pollutants. But the treatments would be different even with not, that? Not necessarily. The treatments, some of them would be the same and some of them would be different. If you supported your, your body's ability, your antioxidant capacity, your, um, uh, your fatty acids and your anti-inflammatories, a lot of that is generic and it would help for many different kinds of stressors. Whether there are certain specific treatments for some chemicals more than others would need work. Um, even with heavy metal chelation, my understanding, I'm not an expert on that and I don't practice it personally, but my understanding is that it does a lot of things besides chelation of the metals. It changes metabolism in a lot of ways. So, I mean, I just don't think we know very much about the meta metabolic uh, issues involved in reducing the body burden of uh, noxious heavy metals and other persistent organic pollutants and other persistent pollutants. We just don't know. And I think it's time we found out because the body burden issue is a big deal. There are people out there who, who are trying to uh, make light of the body burden issue or say that, you know, well, these things are really natural, but, you know, the burden of proof is on, on, on them and, and they're going to have other people doing an end run around them. I think it would be better if we all work together in addressing this thing in a constructive way.